Good Monday, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast. Glad to have you along with this with us on this Monday. Again, don't forget our good friends at Blue Water Climate Control. You can visit them online at BlueWaterClimateControl.com or visit them on Twitter at Blue H2O underscore climate. Today, we're talking about Tennessee and Georgia taking place in 2009. 45-19 is Tennessee's win over Georgia in this game. This is what I would consider the the, the marquee win for Lane Kiffin in his tenure at Tennessee. I mean, a lot of people talk about the Alabama game because that was the number one team in the country and they were lining up for a field goal to win it. But this is kind of the game that put put everything together and got everything going for Tennessee, uh, really on both sides of the ball, but particularly offensively as Tennessee uh, wins 45-19. Jonathan Crompton, if you want to call it a coming out party, whatever, 20 of 27 for 310 yards and four touchdowns. We'll catch up with Jonathan Crompton a little later in the podcast. Um, I'm going to tell my, my best story about this game. Maybe this is the biggest reason why I picked this game. So it's Tuesday. Lane Kiffin's doing media. John Painter is the sports information director. And Lane did a teleconference before he came out and spoke to the media. He did like a like a opposing, you know, with opposing writers or whatever. I don't think it was the SEC teleconference on Wednesdays. I think this was Tuesday. It might have been on Wednesday. And we just started laying a recorder in there just to hear what he said on the teleconference. So John Bryce had laid his recorder in there. And we listened to the recording later. And this is what Lane Kiffin says to John Painter. Hey, John, what do you think about me just going out and guaranteeing a victory? And John Painter, obviously, I, you know, Rob, you know John very well. I, I could coach, coach, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure I'd want to go that direction. He goes, I'll tell you what, he goes, I think I'll go out, guarantee a victory, and tell everybody Jonathan Crompton is going to be the player of the week in the Southeastern Conference. And finally, Painter looks at him, and this is all on tape. So there's, you know, we had evidence of it. Painter, Painter looks at him and says, Coach, you really think we're going to win? And he said, John, there's no way they'll beat us on Saturday. And Tennessee goes out and manhandles, and Jonathan Crompton is indeed the Southeastern Conference Player of the Week with four touchdowns and 310 yards of offense uh, in a game where uh, – Offensively, Tennessee kind of did what they wanted to do. Jonathan made one mistake with an interception. Other than that, Tennessee had people seemingly running open all day long. Oh, I, I love the way they rolled him out in this game. Dude, they moved the pocket a lot with him. Luke Stocker, I mean, Luke Stocker looked so good in this game. You had those moments by Gerald Jones, Denarius Moore, Amar Salas Teague siding Brent Hubs. Flip it to defense, you had Dennis Rogan getting the pick. I mean, and was I mistaken to see at some point in the game, I could have swore I saw Aaron Douglas out there for, oh, yeah. for a good portion. Totally. So, I mean, like, what, what Lane did in, with that offensive line that year with the Sullins brothers and, 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 and so on and so forth it was just super impressive uh, with, with the fact that, you know, when you look at Tennessee's offensive line, and this is no knock on Sullins brothers, they, they, they played to the top of their potential. But at the end of the day, those guys were former walk-ons. So, I mean, like, you know, hey, he got the most out of those kids. They played hard. And in and, and a game like this, they peaked. I, I, I'd forgotten how much Tennessee really dominated this game. I mean, from the, I remember the chunk plays on offense, Crompton's big day. But defensively, man, they just manhandled Georgia up front. I mean, this, this was not a very good Georgia team, you know, in, in hindsight. And um, Joe Cox – you know, for AJ, AJ Green to be saddled with him was uh, had to be its own kind of personal torture. But I had really forgotten how, <laughs> how bad they just made It's like playing in Cincinnati, Rob. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe. But uh, just, you know, forgotten just how they had manhandled them up front. It was um, – that, that was a refresher. And think about Georgia, Georgia scores 19 points, but, you know, 16 well, over. Yeah. 16 of them are, you know, special teams, defensive touchdown, and, and the safety on the, on the block punt. I mean, they could do nothing offensively. I mean, you had Dave, you had Dave Neal in this game saying, you know, where have you been, Jonathan Crompton? Because he had thrown those three interceptions versus UCLA. He had some of those picks uh, in the other in – a, in a loss to Florida. I mean, he was incredible in this game. The way Cheney had him rolling out all the play action – um, and that did not only culminated in his four touchdowns, but I mean, you know, Georgia starts playing two deep safety back. Montario Hardesty runs for 
40-yard touchdown dead up the middle because Georgia's safeties are split so wide because they're deathly afraid of, uh, of all the play action action that's happening. And so this was certainly one that uh, Tennessee, I mean, they boat raced them from basically the, the start to the finish. Well, and we looked at, we, go ahead. I was going to say, we looked at 06 Cal, and then, of course, we looked at this game. And, of course, I've seen the, the Ontario South Carolina plays on Twitter here lately. Um, it just reminds you how good Montario could have been had he not kind of gotten banged up. When he was healthy, he was a thoroughbred. Before he tore his ACL as a freshman, he, he, he generated as much buzz as a freshman as Jamal Lewis did his freshman year. I'm not saying he was going to be Jamal Lewis, but he is a guy that after the first scrimmage in fall camp, everybody was talking about Montario Hardesty, that it was getting ready. He, he was getting ready to burst on the scene. Then he tears the ACL um and, and and struggled with the knee ever since then and and then you know arian foster was there he got a little sideways with with some coaches at one point he left the program went home to north carolina had to be talked into coming back um this is not under lane kiffin this was in, in the previous years uh but when he was healthy and could go he could go and and, and certainly he had a great year that year I, i'm looking back at the deal you, you mentioned the ucla game jesse J jonathan crompton just eight quarters earlier against UCLA for the game was 13 of 26 for 93 yards and three interceptions. Now, Gerald Jones was hurt. They were playing with some young wide receivers, but that was a really struggling Tennessee offense at that point. Started finding themselves a little bit against Auburn the week before the Georgia game and then just absolutely exploded and was really a good offense the rest of the season. When you look at it, they didn't win, you know, they didn't win some games. They got, you know, beat at Ole Miss and some things like that. But that was a pretty good offense the rest of the year for Tennessee with a bunch of guys, some young players, and, and a bunch of people nobody were, was talking about other than, other than how bad they were at the start of the year. Well, one of the biggest takeaways when you rewatch this game is, from my standpoint, Hubs, is, is Cheney's clear belief that his plan – with what he wanted to do with Crompton, uh, he was gonna he was gonna fulfill it. He was gonna continue with it. And so Jonathan throws that pick six that's tipped off the hands. Rambo runs it back. What happens the very next drive? He calls multiple play action passes to let Crompton just keep going right out there and pitching the ball. Georgia softens up the zone. Boom! You get a long touchdown run, and that's how you get up. You know, multiple touchdown. I, I mean. This was from a, you know, non-Tennessee, not knowing the, the history of everything, this clearly had to have been the, the best game of Crompton's career. Yeah, and I mean, and nobody saw it coming. I mean, really, when, Rob, if you go back and, and look at it, when he throws the pick, there were a lot of people who were like, you know, the guy's never going to get it. You know, it's not going to happen. And then it was like, from that point on, and he wasn't bad before the pick, but he was really good after the pick. And, and and played really well the, the, the rest of the way. And, I, you know, I don't know that anybody has been beat up by fans, was beat up by fans more than Crompton was during his tenure at Tennessee. He was not a very well uh, thought of quarterback by Tennessee fans going into that year, booed like crazy in the UCLA game. Every time Cheney was asked about, hey, are you going to play another quarterback or whatever, he was like, no, Jonathan's our guy. He's going to be fine. And, and boom, he was fine in that game. I was you know mention, what? I, yeah, I was going to say I was, I was going to mention what you referenced there, Hubbard. Is how how rough of a time he he got it from from the fan base. I mean, I think it's probably as bad as anybody that that I can remember seeing. And that you know, some of that comes with the nature of the position. You're always going to be sort of the focal point. But I, I think it also. I mean, people had such high hopes for him coming. You know, semi local from being just across the mountain. You know, the inevitable Heath Shewer comparisons because they came from the same little area in Western North Carolina. And just, you know, never quite lived up to it. And I, and I think fans, you know, the disappointment kind of fed the, the dissatisfaction. And Austin made the point earlier, um, a lot of similarities with, with Grantano. I mean, oh, I, I think those two guys are, are eerily similar. When you talk about the, the, the way the fans felt about them at the time, you know, kind of how tough they were, how they kept, you know, just kept battling. And then you factor in that, you know, you go back and, you know, Brent, you're going to talk about this with Jonathan later, 
you know, signed to play for Randy Sanders, ended up with Cutcliffe for two years, had a year of Dave Clawson, then a year of Jim Chaney and Lane, much like it's been a revolving door of Mike DeVore, Larry Scott, you know, Tyson Helton into Jim Chaney, the guy that comes in at the end of the tail end for JG. There's a lot of similarities there between those two. And, uh, you know, I, I would love to pick Jim Chaney's brain to, you know, see what other similarities he sees between two and eight. Uh, and I think that's why there was so much, Jesse, so much expectation for Jared this past season because Jim Chaney's the quarterback whisperer. You know, he, he gets something out of Nathan Peterman at Pittsburgh. Um, he, he gets things out of players. He got Jonathan Crompton, was a part of getting Jonathan Crompton going after, you know, years of, of not performing very well. And I think that's what generated so much hope from Tennessee fans that kind of the light would come on with J.G. We did see that light at times. He just didn't run with it. And maybe that was because of the hand injury or whatever. He didn't run with it the back half of the season the way Jonathan ran with it after this game. Yeah, I mean, literally when you're watching this game, they cut to the same fan twice, love to know the fan's name, who is rocking a poster that says, Crompton for Heisman. This is after a guy who threw four That was the poster on the, uh, the GQ. Yeah. <laughs> this there, is a guy who threw four touchdowns the entire previous season and equals that in this game alone. Uh, and, again, it, it, he credits, as you'll hear on the pod, a lot of that growth to uh, the coaching by Jim Chaney. Obviously, J.J. And, and Lane Kiffin. And Lane Kiffin. And Lane Kiffin, for sure. Uh Obviously, J.G. had a much better season statistically than that a year ago. But if he could even make a similar sort of leap, you know, what kind of team can Tennessee potentially have in, in 2020? I mean, that, that, that's to be determined. The, the quarterback position is one of many, you know, quote-unquote unknowns. And if J.G. can literally make that leap, a Crompton-type explosion, I, I think that you're, you're seeing a potential for this team if other things fall into place, you know, winning nine, ten games. Well, you know, and, I always but, wondered, I always wondered, Brent, what Crompton would have been like had he got a second year with Lane and Jim Chaney. You know, I mean, because he did make a significant stride from that four Auburn touchdowns game to twenty seven. Huh? Four, four touchdowns, touchdowns to twenty seven touchdowns. Yeah, that, so I mean, that's that, what I'm saying. That's I mean, more like, than a, spr a stride. That's like hurdling the Grand Canyon. But go go ahead. Your your point is yeah, valid. I mean, like even, even like my point is like even early in this the season, I think he still had the mental scars of being booed off the field at Auburn the year before and those type of things. And oh, then you know yeah. you, you talk about that mid season jump to get to the 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 late season run that he had. What would he have had? What would he what would he have he have been like had he gotten a second year? Much yeah. like Jared's going to get a second year this year. And I'm not that, saying that he's going to end up being you know, this. I'm just saying comparisons. Well, I think what's interesting that should not be forgotten, you know, Gerald Jones has a big game in this game. He did not play the first part of the season because he was hurt. Austin Rogers hurt a knee. The early part of the year, the offense was playing with some younger players, but then in this game, they get their veterans back. You know, you talk about Crompton in the second year. I, it's a good question. But he wouldn't have had Stocker. He wouldn't have had Jones. He, he wouldn't have had Denarius Moore. He, he yeah, wouldn't yeah. have had Mar Monterio Hardesty. And, and I think that's one of the concerns you have with JG. And, and Jesse's talked about this. He can be better, but his stats may not be better because you don't know how long it's going to take for some of these younger receivers. To, we don't know what D'Angelo Gibbs is going to be and some of those things moving yeah. forward, which I think would have been a real question mark with Jonathan Crompton. Uh, in, in a second year because there would have been so much turnover at the skill spots. Rob, I, I, and I'm going to ask you about this because I know he's one of your favorite players. In, in watching this game, Dan Williams continues to show up. This is a guy who was not going to be on the field. He had played, a, you know, talk about moving him to offensive line, and he, he was an afterthought. This is another game that the NFL scouts continue to see. He finishes this year a first-round draft pick and was not a starter the year before. And and plays for a decade in the NFL. I mean, yeah. Yeah, he was blowing the pocket up all game long on this one. I mean, and that's, you know, one of the, the tenets of football is pre nothing bothers a quarterback like pressure up the middle. And he was – I mean, he was in Cox's face 
all day long. And you bring him up, I think it's ironic, Hubbard, that um, two guys who made who were huge in this game, Dan Williams and Denarius Moore, were kind of throw-in recruits because Tennessee wanted, you know, higher-ranked teammates in, in Lennon Career in, in the case of Denarius and uh, Malcolm – was it Malcolm Rawls? Yes, Malcolm it Rawls. Was. Malcolm Rawls uh, was Dan's teammate in Memphis. And, bo- and, and you know, Dan and, and Denarius were just kind of, you know, afterthoughts. And the, the, the their, their higher-ranked teammates end up washing out of the program. Those two guys go on to, to be NFL players. Well, it was uh, an interesting game from the standpoint of this team really found itself, and it found its swagger. You know, so much of the Lane Kiffin era is all about the bravado and the swagger and all this. Since he didn't really have it up until this point. I mean, look, they had played Florida close, and, and Lane had been in a tit-for-tat with Urban Meyer because Urban accused him of, you know, sitting on the ball to keep from getting beat bad and all of that and, and yeah. all that going on. Right. They, they lost to a bad UCLA team in Knoxville in, in Neyland State. That was not a very good UCLA team. Rick Neuheisel, baby. Rick Neuheisel. So, for, for all of the, you know, the, the lane, Lane's bravado, his team did not have that confidence until this game. And you could, I mean, in rewatching it, you could see it in the second half. It was like, it was like monkeys were lifted off guys' back. Like, oh, I, let's just I, go play and have fun. I mean, I even think, I mean, because we know these guys, some of these guys, I mean, like Chris Walker gets that pick and the team goes bananas. You know, I mean, like there, there was just some plays where, uh, again, you, you, you alluded to being there in the moment midweek, Lane basically saying, hey, we're going to win this game. The team seemed to eat up that sentiment. That, that, that they went in there, guns a blazing, and said, there is no way we're going to lose. And ultimately, they, they, they took Georgia to the woodshed, and that's what happened. Yep, and, and Tennessee was a different football team the rest of the way. Because, again, I, I think it would – it released a lot of the, the bad stuff from the previous year and the slow start and, and things like that that was kind of like, okay, where's all this? I mean, there's been all this offseason talk. Lane's run his mouth. He said all these things. Where, where is the result of it? Because they lost to Auburn. They lost to Florida. They lost to UCLA. I mean, they had beaten, what, Ohio and Western Kentucky? when they come into this game. So it's not like they had done anything. And so this one, everybody kind of erupted, Rob, in the second half, the stands, the players, and everybody, because it was like, oh, that's it. You know what I mean? And I think the players were like, all right, yeah, let's go do this. We, you know, we're, we're pretty good. And, and they played – they were pretty good the rest of the year. And they did have some talent on that team. I mean, looking back, I mean, they, there was a lot more talent on this team than, you know, what Butch was working with early on and certainly what he left – Jeremy, you know, when, when, when he got done burning this thing down after four years. But, uh, I mean, look, Eric Berry, you know, obviously a, a legend. He, he made plays in this game. We, we talked about Dan Williams. But then Luke Stocker still playing in the league. Um, Denarius, McCoy had a bunch of tackles. We, yeah, we mentioned good. Daenerys. I mean, Montario was a, was a really good player who, you know, got – you know, what was in the league for a minute and obviously had some injury problems. And uh, but not to denigrate these guys, but I think this is one thing you see – because well, I mean, having been so involved in recruiting back at this point in time, like I, so many of these guys who were who Philip got that were, you know, huge recruits, been beat out all kinds of people for, just never. I mean, they some of them were good players like Rico McCoy, but just never they weren't you know what what people hoped that they would be. And I think Philip had a lot of those guys. Chris Scott in this game, I and mean, he was a good college player, but you know that was a five star type offensive lineman. And some he, guys, played for all, he played for several years in the league, though. Now, now here, but you're I, right. I the college he, level, like, I mean, he, he was viewed as being an all SC, potential all-SEC guy. And he just you know, didn't quite get there. Uh, same for Gerald Jones. I mean, he's a really productive player. But, I mean, that was a huge recruitment. You remember that, Hubbard? I mean, when, when they snagged him out of Oklahoma, I mean, that was, that was a coup. And then you have some guys like Ben Martin, Adam Myers-White, who should have been on this team and had already washed out of the program. I mean, those were enormous recruits. And um, I think the, there's just a lot of those guys in this game, and I think that was one of the things that led to Phillips' downfall. Some of the guys just didn't pan out. I, I will I, I will ask this for, just from a, you know, uh, non-Tennessee alum, non-Tennessee you know Tennessee historian perspective. You look at what happens after this game. Obviously, they play Alabama super close. 
arguably could have beat the number one team in the country just a week later uh, if Terrence Cody didn't block that field goal. They upset South Carolina, top 25 team. You boat race Memphis. What the hell happens at this Ole Miss game that totally seems to – Dexter McCluster happened. Dexter McCluster. I, I, I'll, I'll tell I, you. I've seen the box score, but I'm saying, <laughs> right. how does it happen? Get, it's two, pretty two, ho-hum Ole Miss team just boat races this group. Two, two things. One, there were three players arrested the week of the Ole Miss game, including all-star safety Jansen Jackson. So that okay. was a bit of an issue. Even on Friday, nobody knew who was going to get to play and who wasn't going to get to play in that game. And then Austin and Rob mentioned Dexter McCluster. Dexter I McCluster, Dexter. well, he was recruited by Ed Orgeron and promised so a lot has, of things has, to play. Yeah, and he did not get to play. Dexter McCluster on Friday night before that game stood up in front of the team and cried. I mean, was angry to the point of tears and turned to Houston Nutt and said, give me the ball. I'll take care of everything tomorrow because I owe Ed Orgeron. I'll take care of tomorrow. And he absolutely – he was the most motivated player. Forward. And he was, he was the best player on the field that day for Tennessee. And Monty Kiffin and Tennessee, Rob, had zero answers for Dexter McCluster that day. I knew it was deep after jet sweep. And, they, I mean, just it, – it's amazing to think how good Tennessee was. And, you know, Georgia didn't have a Dexter McCluster type running back in, in this game. But as good as they were against the run in, in this game, to have that happen to them, you know, just a couple of weeks later was um, – I mean, I still remember being kind of amazed and because they're coming off the Alabama game where, you know, that's it. recently in the rearview mirror, you know, they, they go to, to the wire with the number one team in the country. Yeah, the Ole Miss game, I remember that being a big surprise. Well, the other thing, too, remember they had lost Nick Revez to a, to a knee injury in the South Carolina game, if I'm not mistaken. And so they're playing without their middle linebacker, their inside linebacker, who was kind of the captain of the front seven of that defense. And Tennessee had a hard time playing the edge and getting lined up there, and, and Ole Miss took them to school. I, I'm not making excuses for Tennessee. They got boat raced, and Dexter McCluster what was a huge reason why. But, but, but for Tennessee fans, this Georgia game what was, the, was Jonathan Crompton's, you know, signature moment, if you will. Uh, it was the game that got everybody further on board with what Lane Kiffin was going, which is why it was – such a big deal when he left, you know, in the way that he did. Uh, Tennessee fans felt like things were going. Recruiting was taken off here. Tennessee was working in Georgia, and they had just boat raced Georgia. Uh, and, and a huge win for, for that season for a lot of reasons. Jonathan Crompton, pretty interesting uh, conversation with Jonathan about his year, uh, his Tennessee career, uh, this game, and, and kind of his season uh, coming up here on the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com Rocky Top Rewind podcast. Hey, at East Tennessee, you need a reliable heating and air system designed for your home and our climate. You need a team that's trained and held to the highest of standards. You need solutions, not sales pitches. And right now, you need your air conditioning to work. And if it's not working, you need to give Blue Water Climate Control a call. Veteran-owned, family-operated, they're going to come out and fix your problem and get your house cooled down and get you back in work in order. Whether you need a new system, a major repair, or something simple, they're going to send out someone who can fix it, not someone who's going to tell you, uh, you know, how much money you got to spend and, and you need this and sell you on this, that, or the other. They're going to get it right for you. Uh, they're going to get your air condition right because they're going to send an expert. They'll lay out all the options for you, uh, whether it's replacing your system, upgrading, just fixing a repair, whatever it is, they're going to give that to you. They've got all kinds of options for financing if you need it as well. You can even rent to own with them. Give them a call today at 865-299-2290 or visit bluewaterclimatecontrol.com to make an appointment. Blue Water is an authorized dealer for American Standard Heating and Air Conditioning. For Jesse Simonton, Austin Price, and Rob Lewis, I'm Brent Hubbs. Jonathan Crompton in an interesting conversation coming up next here on the Rocky Top Rewind podcast. Welcome back to the Rocky Top Rewind podcast brought to you by Blue Water Climate Control. Happy to have joining us now, Jonathan Crompton, as we talk about the 2009 Georgia game. Jonathan, 20 of 27, 310 yards, four touchdowns, and one interception. What do you remember about that week? Because everybody views that game as the turning point kind of for you and for that season. 
not that the season was necessarily awful at that point, but no, that I mean, was when you guys got hot. You got going. Well, we really started getting going uh, second half of Auburn game. But the hardest part about everybody saying, oh, well, you finally, you guys finally started clicking and all this stuff, people fail to realize that we had a lot of injuries in fall camp. I mean, especially the skill players. We were having to play freshmen that were great athletes, but the guys that we were relying on were our juniors and seniors that were injured, you know, and then um, losing Austin Rogers in the summer to an E injury. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that right there in itself was a big blow. Because um, the unfortunate part was we weren't as deep at every position as a lot of teams. Um, and that just that happens to every team. Some, somewhere there in time. Um, so we just, you know, we were relying on guys that maybe a little too early. Right. Um, but the good part is it, did, it got them experience. Um, it made us kind of learn on the run a little quicker. But uh, I would say we really, really clicked the second half of, of Auburn. And then Georgia, we, you know, it was the, the – this, to me, is a very big – one of the biggest compliments for uh, Lane Kiffin was we – they came out and played a lot more cover, too, than we thought they were going to play. A lot more. Um, on the run, we started calling cover two beaters. You know, stuff that we – was in our arsenal, but it wasn't what we really thought we were going to rely on that week. Um, a lot more play action because having Ontario on the backfield – Obviously, it was a plus. Um, so, we, you know, our deal that week was not going into the week was a lot of run, play, action. But then after the first series, we really started realizing, well, hell, that's the way we need to go. Um, so, we started doing those and hitting the backside dig routes versus cover two, trying to put Luke Stocker one-on-one -on -one with a linebacker and cover two over the middle. And that was, that's where uh, Lane did such a good job was calling the game as it flowed, not just being – up to a game plan, understanding, hey, we got we got to adjust, and he he did a, a really good job of that that week, um, especially. What was that good for you? Challenging for you? Another new system in your career, but to, to that you might get into games and you might run stuff that you hadn't really repped in practice for for a couple of weeks, but but it was, hey, we're gonna adjust as you go. You know was that what? something that was okay with you? Was that easy for you? Here's the thing. And I've been very quiet, very quiet over the years about all this stuff. You know, um, people can say what they want about every individual. Especially nowadays, I really don't care anymore in that sense. And I know it sounds bad, but I don't mean it in a bad way. Because at the end of the day, Nobody knew that system and any system better than I did. Obviously, you shouldn't. You're the quarterback. Right. Um, if they do, then the quarterback probably needs to study a little more. Um, but Lane was the only one that had the, the confidence to end game adjust. Um, and that, that's my personal opinion. People have other opinions. That's completely up to them. Um, but he was the one that in game adjusted the best, but also knew there's always, this is the beauty of football. There's always going to be ups and downs in it, no matter what. Um, and you know, unless you're just, unless you got 22 first round draft picks, there's going to be ups and downs. And even then there's going to be some that's, you know, that's why football is the ultimate team sport. You got to overcome adversity. He was the best coach ever. You fix it behind closed doors. We'll fix it in the meeting room. We'll fix it on the practice field, whatever. But it was never brought publicly that anybody, any one particular player did a bad job during the game, was wrong in their assignment. And that's why guys started really playing for him. That was the first time in our whole uh, collegiate career we had a coach that was going to say, that was my fault. I got a coach harder. I should have done this. I should have done that every week. Um, and then behind closed doors, hey, man, that's just that's, – you mess up, you mess up. we got to correct it in some way, somehow. Um, and he, he did a phenomenal job of that. He knew how to take a group of guys 
that were very talented but had been mentally beat up over years and get them to come together collectively and play together and have fun doing it. And it finally showed. Um, like I said, starting the second half of Auburn and then Georgia, it was just – it was almost like we could do nothing wrong. What's interesting in, in re-watching that game is you had a pick in that game, a pick six, that kind of – I remember everybody was kind of like, oh, wait a minute, maybe, you know, wait, wait a minute, what, what's going on with the offense? Then they come right back, and he stays with the cover two beaters and puts it back in your arms. He doesn't go – you know, they don't – he and Chaney don't go into a shell in terms you know of why? play calling. How important was that for you? Because they, they're not afraid. Bottom line. They weren't afraid of scrutiny. They weren't afraid to say bad things happen in a football game. You know what I'm saying? I'm not going to call right. anybody out and say things that have been said behind closed doors um, to 18 and 19 and 20-year-old kids that should never be said, ever. He was not that guy. Chaney is not that guy. Like it's just, hey man, you throw a pick, <laughs> throw a touchdown this time. Let's go. Let's have. Some, I mean, because that's just that's what it is. It's football. If you grade out a hundred percent, your coach probably didn't grade you hard enough. At the end of the day, you should not grade out a hundred percent because there's always something we can get better at, always. And that 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 was the mindset. That was the mentality of the team. I guarantee you, if you see a pitcher be throwing a pick, I'm probably laughing, coming off the field, going, "It was that close." <laughs> that close because I had the balls to make the tight throws. I, I had confidence in my arm. I, but the thing is, I had confidence in my receivers and tight ends and running backs to make the play in a contested situation. And that's what Lane really let everybody do. So so what? Just, what's the emotions of that game? I mean, like, I know it's having fun. I, I remember oh, going, yeah. in, going into the fourth quarter, y'all are, are dancing and hopping around. What, what's that? three and a half hours and in the locker room like for you because look it, it's been it's been a tough road to that moment you had not had a quote big win that was a signature win for you what was that what was that afternoon in that moment Dude, that locker room like at the end of the day you know me well enough you hear the concern in my voice of saying I didn't have a signature win if people knew the true stories the true stuff to happen behind the scenes there'd be a there'd be a lot of different feelings in Knoxville from a lot of people. So you hear the concern in my voice with people saying, oh, well, this, this, this. Dude, I really don't care. At the end of the day, we fought together as a team because that's what we were. We were a team. It wasn't one person having a signature win. It was everybody playing together, going to meetings early on or early every day. 5 a.m. workouts, spring practice, ball camp in Knoxville, miserable heat. Every Saturday, was a time to have fun and let it out. Win, lose, or draw. Yes, you want to win them all. That's the reason why you go to Tennessee, obviously. Um, but at the end of the day, when fans don't understand what you put into it, and they – I mean, I'm going to kind of go off script here and look what Tom, Tom uh, Herman said. Good for him. It is a double-edged sword with fans. That's just the reality. You know, I've had somebody look me in the face and go, oh, that's what you look like without a helmet. Well, no, duh, I'm a human being. <laughs> Obviously. You know what I mean? So if people really knew the true backstory behind everything, then people wouldn't say, oh, well, Jonathan Crompton had a signature win, blah, blah, blah. No, dude, this is a team effort. That was what I always said. And, right. And always will believe. Um, so for that, the that was, that was, but that was everybody's mindset on our team. Was and it should be that way for every team. That you, those are the guys you go to battle with every day. You, you, nobody, nobody else is on campus doing five a.m. workouts in June. You know what I mean? Doing, going and running campus, running eight hundred meters in the summer, stuff like that. So that was what was so cool about it. Is it, it, it overflows into football season. And so for us, every win was a signature win because. Wins are hard to come by, especially in the SEC. Right. So, 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 so that one is no more special than any other. Not for win. me. Not for me personally. No. Interesting. Um, like I said, they're so hard to come by, and it's you know, 
you're playing in literally the toughest conference in America. People call it the mini NFL or NFL junior because that's what you're playing against every week. Um, go back and look at NFL first round draft picks by conference every year. You know what I'm saying? And not even just first round, draft right. in general. Right. And that's what you go. So they're, they're always hard to come by. Always. Um, doesn't matter who you're playing. You know, nobody's just going to roll over, and especially in that conference. So no win was more special than the other, in my opinion. Um, but it obviously did feel good to get that win. That that game, that, that afternoon, I mean, winning that game, you guys obviously the next week, you know, were lining up for a field goal to, to beat the number one team in the country. You had – I know you guys had confidence before then, and you mentioned the Auburn thing. Did that afternoon against Georgia – take that team's confidence to a different plateau? Was, was Monday on the practice field any more like, hey, we're going to win this week? Or, was, or is it the same way Monday was of Georgia week or of, of UCL and, week or of Auburn week? And honestly, I would say it was probably the same because we had music playing during warm-ups like always. We did the same warm-up just like always. Obviously, you knew you're going into Alabama week. You're obviously one, you know, smoke the cigars. You know what I mean? You want those moments. Um, I don't think it was necessarily, and I could be wrong because it's been so long ago. Sure. Like to physically remember that exact emotion at practice, but practices were always fun and intense because we had that 20-minute period at the end of practice every day that was unscripted, O versus D. So we always were up for practice because we always knew at the end we played a 20-minute game essentially. Um Obviously, it wasn't it wasn't full tempered. It you know it was subtle them up. It wasn't like we're just scrimmaging, but it simulated a game, so we would become more game ready. Okay. Um. So it was, in my opinion, it was no different than any other one. Obviously, you knew you were playing Alabama, but this was bef- at the beginning of the Alabama dynasty. So it wasn't right. like it would have been Alabama two years ago or this past year. So maybe then it might have been a little different, but then it was at the end of the day. We know what the third Saturday in October is. You know, we're going to Tuscaloosa. We want to win there, you know, very badly. We want to smoke the cigar in the locker room. And it, I think the guys that would have meant a little more to instantly would be the guys from Alabama. But it was still the same work day on that Monday, technically Tuesday. Right. Two, two stories for me that, that jump out. One, I don't know if you've ever heard this story. Lane Kiffin, the week of the Georgia games, doing getting ready to do his – teleconference and in his regular media deal and he turns to John Painter and he says John what do you think if I just go out there and guarantee a win and I also guarantee, and, me. and I also and I also predict to everybody that Jonathan Crompton is going to be the offensive player of the week that was on Tuesday that that he said that and he believed that he believed that you guys were going to beat Georgia he liked the matchup he liked everything about it that, that's one story that I want to get your reaction to the other is Later in the year, you guys were playing South Carolina, and you, you hit the seam route to Austin Johnson. I, re- I remember watching it at practice, and Austin had dropped it a couple of times. And Lane looked at him and said, I'm giving you a touchdown. All you got to do is catch the ball. Yeah. H- how many times – or how, what's it feel like when you go to the line of scrimmage and you know the play call and you look out there and you go, this is a touchdown? What, what's, that, what's that feel like? You know, and, and... – so, kind of go off the first story, that doesn't surprise me. It sounds like something he would do in the sense of everybody knew the highly touted recruit I was, blah, 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 right? That was the first year, besides Randy Sanders, that I was actually allowed to be myself. Right? And it's, right. it's a public deal. I sure. came to Tennessee okay. because of Randy Sanders. Right. That was why I came to Tennessee. Um, unfortunate situations after year one, hurt my shoulder in camp. Red shirt, he gets, he gets let go. But Lane was the first one since then that was like, hey, man, be yourself. We've got to build around you. Be yourself. Right? It's like, okay, I mean, I'm not, not myself, but cool, let's do this. <laughs> um, I was also not afraid to check to a run at the line of scrimmage when you see four strong blitz or four weak blitz 
you know the uh, the backside defensive ends dropping. And I got Montero Hardison. I'm cool with that. Check outside zone away. Let him do his thing. South Carolina, we Montero's famous spin move. Yeah. That was an audible. Why not give the ball to that guy? You know <laughs> what I mean? Sure. But that was me being myself. And Lane was like, hey, we're what we're going to do is we're going to hone in each week. We're going to come up our audibles, depending on who we're playing. You got free reign when you see this, but you, when you come off the field, make sure you're right. I was like, okay, cool. You know, that's that. now it's on me to make sure I'm prepared that way. There was multiple times that we do that. Now, there was a time that sometimes you got to have a little guts. We are playing Bama. I checked to a – when Montero got the little lower out down the sideline, I checked because I, I was 100% confident. And knowing they were they were playing, Saban disguised it, rolled away from it, and went to a, a like a two zone blitz. And it's not a great play call into that. I had to make a great throw. Montero made an even better catch. Sometimes that happens, but more times than not, we were right in our audibles. So that that first story does not surprise me because Lane had seen my knowledge of the game. He had seen my confidence in my teammates. You know what I mean? With, I'm going to throw you open, just be there. Or if you're wide open, I, I cannot miss you. I deal. Um, I, I don't, that doesn't surprise me one bit because he, he 100% knew our matchup was really good week in, week out. It was just a matter of if it's, I mean, it's in the day, it's football. You got to make the plays. Right. Um, so, I mean, that one does not surprise me at all. So, what's, um, it, what's it like when you get to the line and you know you've got the perfect call? I can actually vividly remember this. The whole week, South Carolina week, he's telling, he tells me, he's, listen, second play of the game, we're scoring. And I'm like, I go, what are you talking about second play? He's like, they're going cover zero, second play. And I was like, dude, it's Tuesday. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we haven't even practiced yet. He was like, I don't know my stuff. He goes, we're going to get the ball on the, like when we get it here, we're going to show them this formation and they're going to cover zero. We're hitting Austin up the middle. I was like, okay. <laughs> okay. You know what I mean? Right. Like, I believe you, but I'm calling BS at the same time. Right. Tuesday. And uh, every day he would just kind of joke, hey, dude, we're scoring. Austin up the middle. And then, like you said, Austin, all you got to do is catch it. I'm giving you this touchdown. When they fumbled, we got the ball. He goes, hey, second play. You know what's coming. You know what I mean? And he's like, straight up, he's like, you know what's coming, second play. It comes in, and I was like, I just look at Austin. I was like, dude, touchdown. Like, score. He's like, all right, let's do this, man. Cool, let's go, you know. Get in line of scrimmage, and I'm sitting there. I can in my head go, "Holy blank! They're going cover zero. <laughs> Just do what we practiced all week. It's going to be a touchdown. You know what I mean? Just right over the backer, a number two ball, as I call it, over the backer, under the safety type deal. And when I throw it out, if you go back and watch the film, as soon as Austin caught, I just start running. Right. Because I was like, holy shit, he was right. <laughs> like, oh, my God. You know, so th there have been a few times that you do know, hey, this play is going to work. They cannot be right. And th it's a fun story, but it's also – it goes back to how much he actually game planned. Right. How much studying he did on his opponents. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And if you go, like, on our Friday walkthroughs, our 15 plays – those were our 15 plays. Now, yes, play number three might not be necessarily play number three, depending on the situation, right? But we ran those 15 plays because we knew those 15 plays were going to work. And when we came in and he gave us the, the sheet on the in the team meeting room, you could feel excitement from everybody going, oh, that one's going to work. Oh, hey, that one's going to work. Because he, he instilled that confidence about himself. Within us, that was what that was what was so cool about it. But yeah, so when you get a line of scrimmage, there are certain times that you go, 
my God, this is going to be it. And and it, it's a great feeling when it works out. I mean, the same thing in the same game. We had practiced a fourth, uh, fourth down touchdown, right? Right. And he goes, hey, we're going for it? And I was like, why not? We practiced it all week. You said anywhere close, we're going for it. He goes, all right, man, you know what the play call is? Go. We had already knew what our fourth down goal line play call was. So those are the things. That's why you know they're going to work because you practice them, and he practices what he preaches, and that is consistent. That's why if you look everywhere he's been, he's been successful. I want I want to ask you back about the Georgia game. You you and Gerald Jones had had good chemistry, but as you mentioned, he had been beat up. Was he just healthier that game, or was it what they were doing that opened it up for him? Because you two got hot, really hot in that game. I mean, he had the early touchdown, then he had the deep ball. Yeah, I think a lot of it was – it's kind of a mixture. He was finally healthy, but it didn't It didn't hurt that they were playing a lot of cover, too, and we were just going to throw the ball. You know what I mean? Because um, we had the right scheme to beat cover, too. And uh, like I said, he adjusted on the run, but we always had a couple double moves in every week for certain coverages if they were going to adjust or whatnot. Um, so we always had a couple double moves for shot play. So we went to it, and, I mean, obviously it, it worked out. But I think that a lot of it had to do with Gerald actually being healthy. You know, finally, and I, don't, and I haven't talked to him about it, but it, maybe he was just feeling better that week. But I knew, he, he, you know, he had been banged up all year. And, you know, like I said, we had a few of those at the receiver position. But when guys started coming back, the veteran guys, you started seeing more production from everybody the run game started getting better because the pass game was there more. You know, then the play action game was there more. Well, now that the play action game is there more and the run game is there, they're starting to crowd the box. Now we're going to go ahead and just do a drop back pass. So everything kind of molded together a little better. And uh, I mean, it would have been nice to see a full season with everybody healthy. And then also being able to have Austin outside as well. We would have been able to, to make some noise, um, especially in the East. Well, it was an interesting season, for sure. You're playing with two walk-on offensive linemen and the Sullins twins who had great years, you know, and Montario had a great year. You've played a lot of football. You played in the Canadian League. You played at Tuscola High School and, and Wayne, just outside Waynesville and had a great prep career. How fun was that year of football, that, that, co that college year? I know you, you don't live it, in the it, past, it fun, but how fun was it? Well, it was fun. It was the reason that was that year was the first time I felt, man, this is finally why I came here. It was fun again because it wasn't just always beat people down. Um, it's not a bad thing to say I'm going to break you down to build you up the way I want you, but if you don't build anybody back up, it's kind of hard. And that was the case with a lot of guys. Um, that was the first year that everything was actually football again I would say um yeah so I mean I don't know where it would rank as far as all the years that I played but I mean it's definitely up there well it was a fun year to watch it was a fun game to watch against Georgia because you took them to the woodshed you guys controlled it the whole day Jonathan thanks for your time I appreciate you joining us here on the Blue Water Climate Control Rocky Top Rewind podcast thanks my man thanks for having me buddy all right bud. appreciate it